We're getting to the end of the summer series we've been in called Leadership University, and I hope this has been a good series for you. We're going to start another one in two weeks, all right? So today and next week, we're talking about leadership. You're going to want to not miss those. You, well, you're not missing them because you're here today, but don't miss next week. We're going to finish big with this. And then we start a new series uh, August 8th, all right? So you'll want to be here for that. But as we finish this series, I wanted to finish strong, all right? So the next two Sundays, I hope all of these have been strong, uh, but today and next week, hey man, I'm just going to push hard. Is that okay? Um, and we're going to drill down deep into leadership and what it means, especially uh, spiritual leadership and Christ-like leadership uh, in the church and in the world. Um, and, you know, one of the dangers of things like we're doing this summer, or just one of the cautions, I've noticed this, because I go to leadership conferences and stuff like that, you get good information. And so leadership very often can be informational, and it kind of just gets stuck up here. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And to get it to travel to here so that it moves from informational to watch this, transformational, where it does something in my life and changes the way that I lead, maybe in my family, as a husband, as a wife, as a mom, as a dad, in school system, as a student, in college, and whatever, in the church. Where it's hard to take it from here to here, isn't it? That is a, it's not very far, but it's like really far to take it to the heart. So we don't want this to just be informational. We want it to be transformational here in your heart. Because once your heart is transformed, you know what happens? It goes to your hands and you actually do stuff with it. And so I'm gonna push hard for that. Don't let what I'm talking about today be informational only. It's important, but it needs to be transformational so that it actually impacts our life. All right, life is a journey, yes? Y'all agree with that? You're like, uh, can I not? I mean, if you're watching online, life is a journey. Uh, at Quest, we've always thought that, and so even our logo speaks of it. Here's our logo at Quest, and it's got a path on it, because a journey is like a path that you're on. Some people have thought that was a river, and I'm like, okay, well, that's a water path. All right, it can be a river path, whatever. But the logo itself represents the reality that life is a journey that we are on. So I want to take that path and I want to make it a little bit long. Man, you are on it, Scott. I mean, just, it's a little bit longer, right? Because I'm going to use this image today of life being like a journey, life being a path. For our purposes at church, and this probably doesn't shock you, I want to talk about it in a spiritual way. So I'm going to add a cross to the end of the path. When I do that, all of a sudden it's like, all right, life's not just a journey. Life's a journey towards something. And so I want to talk about this path today, and we're talking about leadership, but I want to talk about this path like it's, you could call it uh, God's best for your life. Do you believe that God has a best way to live in this life? Do you believe he's designed life and everything, relationships, the way we are to be at work, um, how our minds are supposed to work, what we're supposed to think about, all these things, like a path, a journey, and that God has a very best in mind for you. Now, if you're not a Christian, I'm glad you're here. You're considering whether this might be true. I don't know if you've added the cross yet to the path, right? But if you're a Christian, I'm here to tell you that this is the reality of life, that God has a plan for our lives. He has something that's best for us. And I wanna talk about that today. You could call this, um, here's getting real churchy, but so I'm warning you, it's churchy. This is holiness. I say that and you kind of, I don't know if I like that word. What is holiness? Holiness is God's best. It's when people's lives are so transformed that they say, I'm going to live the path that God has called me to. I'm going to stay on this path. I'm going to do everything I can to be on this path. But that's not reality, is it? What I mean is God does have a path. God does have a way. Let's say God does have a best for us and the way that we're to live. But this is what you and I do. We take our own path. We veer off the path. Scripturally speaking, the whole story's like that. All you got to do is go back to Genesis 
Adam and Eve, creation, God laid out a path. Here's my best for you. My best includes not eating of this tree. Don't do that. Everything else is great. I designed you, I know. <laughs> and then what did Adam and Eve do? They took their own path. They went a different way. They veered off the path. This is the reality of life. Even though that God has given us his best and what he wants for us, we veer off of it. We go different ways. And some of us sometimes don't have the information or knowledge or wisdom, but once you know it, you're like, really, that's God's best? Oh, have you ever, I like not forgiving that person because they royally ticked me off, you know? Like, I understand God forgave me, but he wants me to forgive others, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Oh, I'm supposed to trust God for everything? Yes, oh, I don't like that. I got it my own self, you know? So we veer off the path, don't we? So what I want to do today, especially if you're a Christian, I think this is great if you're not a Christian to think through and to know that this is the, by the way, this is the Christian life. If, if people don't tell you this or you haven't seen this, we call that church face here at Quest. They just faking it. They're lying to you. They're not okay all the time. Christians don't have it together. They mess up, amen? We all mess up. I'm going to talk about that today. We veer off God's path for us, intentionally and even unintentionally sometimes. But I want to talk about today is this. What do you do when you veered off the path? What do you do when you've taken steps away from God's best for your life? And you might go, yeah, I just kind of, man, how did you know? Like, I just stepped off the path this week. Some of us have been off the path for a long time. And, and I want to talk about what, what do you do? How do you respond to that? What, what is the answer to that? Um, I hope that's helpful to you today. I hope it's helpful because I got to tell you, on paper, I had already planned this out, and this was not what I was going to talk about today. I was going to talk about strengths and, you know, your gifts and how you're supposed to use those for God. Uh, and when we do that together, that's a good thing. Y'all, that's a great message, and I'm just not going to preach it. Sorry. Because I felt on Monday like, I need to go in a different direction because I think more people are here right now. And sometimes you have to talk about this before you can talk about the other things. It's hard to use your gifts and strengths and things like this when you feel like I'm not even on the path that I'm supposed to be on. All right, so if you have veered off or if, you're, if you know yourself and you know you'll veer off again because that happens, right, then this message is for you today. And I, this is for all ages, man. I really believe there's students that need to hear this. Don't write this off as an adult sermon. This is for adults, for kids, for students, for all of us. It's really, really important. So here's the story I wanna use in scripture. Jesus is gonna be our professor, hopefully not me today, but I'm gonna use his words and I'm gonna kinda of unpack it for us. And we're gonna learn what happens when you go off the path and what you're supposed to do. And especially what leaders do when they veer off the path, all right? And I want to use one of my favorite stories from scripture. I use it a lot. It's just so good. Sorry, I'm the preacher, so you have to listen to it a lot. Um, it's called the prodigal son story in Luke chapter 15. Um, Jesus is talking to uh, some religious people, religious leaders, and they don't like the way he's doing ministry. That's why I said in the intro video, it says Jesus's idea of leadership was very different than that in the world that day and you know if we're going to follow Jesus and we got to follow his way of leadership not what the world says leadership is <clears throat> so Jesus is talking to some religious leaders who are condemning him for the way he's loving broken people sinners right and so he says let me share with you why I do what I do and what God's like and he shares some stories one of them is called the prodigal son and so in Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 11, it says this, to illustrate the point further, so Jesus has already told two stories, lost sheep, lost coin stories, you may know those, you may not, but read Luke 15, it's in there. Jesus told them one more story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, all right, so he comes to dad, I want my share of your estate now before you die. Rude, rude. He can't wait till his dad dies to get the money. I want mine now. Very rude. In fact, so rude that culturally speaking, what the family could do to the child that did this is stone them to death. 
Father doesn't allow that to happen. He actually divides the estate up. Says, um, so the father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. He's still alive. It's not a will being read. Maybe it was written in there, but he just says, okay, here's what you get. A few days later, the younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. He's leaving home. He's kind of veering off the path. He's already veered off the path with the question, right, of giving me the money. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. All right, dude's screwing up, messing up. He's off the path that his dad would want for him. This isn't what his dad wanted. He wasted all the money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. So the dude like is out of money. He ain't got no points on the Chick-fil-A app. I mean, he's got nothing. He's got no cards left for like, you know, Cracker Barrel or whatever. You know, he, he's got, did I say Cracker Barrel? I mean like, um, you know, other places as well. He's got no cards left for any of that. And he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into his field to feed pigs. Y'all, this is like not fun. The young man became so hungry that even the pods or slop as some translations, he was feeding the pigs, looked good to him but no one gave him anything. So this is one of those moments, you ever been watching a movie or you, some of y'all like Survivor and stuff like this, these shows, um, where people get so hungry, they'll eat anything. And you're like, that's gross. And you're like sitting there with pizza, eating it at your house. You know, we like, we won't eat something because it doesn't have the topping we want on it. Like this dude was starving. He would have eaten the bad toppings. It says that he, even the pig slop that's some nasty looking stuff. He was willing to eat that, but nobody would even give him any of that. Then it says this, check out this verse. When he finally came to his senses, that's really important. He'd veered off the path, God's best, his father's best. And remember, Jesus is telling a story, but the story is meant to illustrate something bigger. It's a, it's a story with a bigger story point. That's what a parable is. That's what this story is. And it's Jesus talking. All right. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, self, at home, back where I came from, where I left, where I veered off the path from, even the hired servants have enough food to spare. So now he's thinking of the servants at his house, the workers. And here I am dying of hunger. I'm going to go home to my father. And I'm going to say, quote, father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm going to own up to it. And I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. So please take me on as a hired servant. He's just starving to death. He doesn't think he's going to be able to be the father's son anymore, uh, which is going to be a surprise to him that he is. Um, but will you take me on as a hired servant? And then I'm going to end right here. The story goes on, but it says, so he returned home to his father. He returned home. Now, in the story, Jesus is going to explain that when he's almost home, his father sees him, and he's going to run out to protect him, because remember, his family's gathering up rocks at this point. Here comes our stupid brother. Let's take him out for what he did to dad, right? That was rude. The father runs. He goes out to him. He surrounds him, protects him, hugs him, and that makes the family drop the rocks. And then he says, let's have a big party. My son was gone. He was dead, but now he's back. He's alive. He's home. He's returned to us. And they celebrate this reality. So he gets a father that he didn't expect. Uh, and, and that's a great story. And, and usually that's what I focus on when I talk about this, is you're a, you're a child of God, not a servant of God first. And even though you're trying to earn it all the time and you're feeling like God's going to take you out for what you've done, he doesn't. And it's grace and welcome back home to the path. But what I want to focus on today is the reality that he came to his senses, because I'm talking about leadership and what happens when you veer off the path. And so that part where it says, so he returned home to his father, all right? So think about your life. God has a path and we're walking the path. And sometimes we veer off the path this way, and then we veer off the path that way. And I said, what are we supposed to do when we have veered off the path? What is it that we do when that happens. And so if you're off the path today, if you're a step away from it or you're a thousand steps from it, what are you to do? This is gonna sound so simple to you, but it is the answer. 
And this text teaches us about it. Here it is. I'm going to use the word leaders. Leaders always return. What do you mean? To God's best. When you veer away from the path that God has set for you in life, in a relationship, in your thought life, in your mind, with an addiction, with whatever, whatever it is, you return home. You come back. That's what leaders do. Leaders don't stay off the path. People who want to make an impact for God, if that's you, you have to come back to the path. That's what, that's what leaders do. So I was thinking about this personally, and I was like, I wonder if I could, well, if Wes, our creative director, could illustrate this for me. Here's my life, all right? Anybody identify with this? Oop, I'm back. Oop, no, yeah. And then I said to the earlier service, I don't think I realized it, but it kind of ends with like, I'm getting towards the end of that path. Uh Uh-oh. (laughs) What does that mean? I am getting older. The path, though, just keeps going into the distance, all right? That's my life, y'all. And it really, four times wandering is not enough. It's thousands. Amen? Amen just means yes. I haven't just veered off four times. It's every day with every decision, the way I relate to my wife, my kids. Y'all know I have an anger issue. I've talked about it. Um, just, the, just the way I live my life, I veer off the path. And it's interesting. I want you to look at that because every time it's different. It's a different number of steps away. And sometimes I veer off a lot real quick and get back quick. Other times I kind of veer off and I'm kind of near the path, but I'm like, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment, what that is. Um, but I'm not really on the path. I'm just, I've kept it within eyesight. <laughs> Other times I look back and I go, where'd the path go? Anybody know what I'm talking about? This is life. And we're talking about leadership. And, and people are watching us. And so I could say this about Christians for sure, but I I especially want to up that a little bit and talk about leaders. And what I've said right now is that leaders always return to God, to God's best. That's what that story represents, right? There's so much about it. And, And then you're surprised when you go back, hopefully, that he's a loving father. He's a gracious father. He protects you, even from people who would want to hurt you. There's a whole other message there, because you know what most people do, church does? They pick up rocks, see someone, and, oh, you think you're coming back. I'm going to beat you up a little bit first, right? No, what does the father do? Runs out. And so we just got to drop the rocks, y'all. I've done a sermon before. I said you can't love someone with a rock in your hand. You just can't do it. You can't be like, well, if you don't respond right, no. And so what? What do we do when we veer off the path? We return. And I know that sounds simple, but we return. What do we return from? Let me get specific for you. I think there are, where do we come into our senses about? I think there are three things. At least in my life, I've, there's more than three. But I want to give you the big three for me, and I bet you identify with these as well. The first one won't shock you at all, probably. You'll go, yeah, that makes sense. You're probably already thinking it. I'll give it to you here in a second. Starts with an S, ends with an N, and has an I in the middle. All right. (laughs) Oops. But the second two are going to be more subtle and stuff that you might not have thought about. But we need to talk about them all. So the first thing we return from is sin. When we have done wrong... When we have left God's path, that's called sin, what do we have to do? Return. Uh, what, what is sin? Uh, I love how the book of Romans talks about it. There's a verse there that says, for we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I've always liked that verse because it actually, the word for sin is an archery term and it means to miss the mark. And so it's like God has made a mark and said, this is how you're to live. And you and I shoot, and we go, whoa, I missed. You know, let me try that again. God, I got this. Whoa, I missed again. It's like our arrows just keep missing God's mark of perfection and like holiness and the path. It's like, I can't stay on this path. You ever felt like that? 
And so what Paul is doing in the book of Romans is not trying to set us up for failure. He's trying to help us understand you need a savior. You need somebody who hit the mark every single time. And that's God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. This is the good news about, about Jesus. This is why we can't do it on our own and we need Christ. This is salvation. This is why no other gospel works but the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're turning the gospel into lots of things today. The gospel is Jesus Christ and that he saves us. That song we just sang was intentional about the King of Kings. It told the story of God and coming into this world in a manger, leaving this world on a cross, well, really an open grave, and what God did to rescue us from our sin. If you don't know you're a sin sinner, you won't know you need a savior. This is not bad news, this is good news. It's great news because we miss the mark. And so God sends Jesus to cover us and to make us right in his sight through the blood of Jesus. This is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that we can, watch this, live lives of holiness. Did you know, I don't think we say this enough in the church, you can live the life God has for you. You don't have to sin. Now, I know you hear that and you go, no, preacher, like I'm gonna sin. Why? You don't have the choice to follow God? Of course we do. We need to begin understanding that we have choice and freedom. God loves us, but he doesn't tell us, I want you to fail, I want you to fail. I want, no, what does he say? I've got a path for you. You're covered in the blood of Jesus. Walk the path. Learn why I want it to be this way. I've designed life. There's a reason this hurts when you do it. There's a reason that screws you up. There's a reason you're in this mess. There's a reason your brain's going haywire over this. It's because that's not what I have for you. Well, I'm gonna try it again, God. You ever done that? I have. I like it. It's pleasurable. Or it's all about me. We're a self culture. Me, me, me. We start with me. What we do now is we start with us instead of God. When you start with you, you will always make God look like you. We've got to start with God and look at him and go, who are we supposed to be? So he has this path for us. He has this way that he would want us to live. And when we don't do it, that's sin, but he covers us in Jesus Christ. And we can, we can follow him. It doesn't mean you won't mess up, but don't let that, see, every time I say that, I go, oh, good, I can mess up. Paul calls that in the New Testament foolishness, that you just go, well, I can sin, because, hey, grace. And if I sin bigger, bigger grace. Does that really sound wise to you? Hey, God, I'm going to make a really big mistake so that I can experience your grace in a much bigger way. <laughs> now, if you make a mistake, I have. I've lived a life even of addiction before with something. I realized how big the grace of God was. I tested it. I didn't think it was true, actually. I, that was the bigger thing is once the addiction was over, I was like, I don't think the grace of God covers me. Everybody else, but not me. You done that? So yes, his grace is big, but we don't test it just to be foolish. Does that make sense? You can live the life God has called you to live. And so if you, if you are right now, we all sin, but if you are in the middle of that and you know it and you recognize it, and as I talk about it, there's something that you're going, I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. <laughs> this isn't about me. It's, not, it's about God's best for you. Return, return, come to your senses, stop. If you think that you're gonna be able to make an impact for God in this kingdom and just keep doing that too, it's not, it's not the way God works. It's going to take you further and further from the path. I'm not saying you're not saved, you're not rescued by God, you're not a Christian. I'm just saying you're not going to make an impact for him. Do you want to make an impact? Do we want our church to make an impact? Then we're called to lives of holiness, following after God. Not, not people who go, we're holy, you're not. That's not, man, the balance of that is so important. Live your holy life and keep your mouth shut. Amen? Don't rock around going, you're not holy. I'm holy. Then you become like a Pharisee. That's what they did. And Jesus points at them and goes, you guys got it so wrong. No grace, no love, no. No, that's not what we do. 
All right, sin, return from that. All right, that's everybody, you kind of expect that, right? Now, don't make light of it. We need to return some of us. But I think if I left it there, a lot of us would go, oh, I'm not in the middle of anything big right now. Some of us are, but maybe some of us aren't. So let me talk about two more that I've veered off the path from. These are much more subtle. The last one's going to be the most subtle of all, but here's the second one, self-sufficiency, which is a sin. What is self-sufficiency? Self-sufficiency is just what it is. I trust myself. I'm a Christian, but I trust myself. I put my trust in God, but I trust myself. <laughs> I'll take care of things for myself. I got this covered. And certain personality types and the way God wired us, I don't know why, but we struggle with this maybe more. I do think this is a tougher one to notice, isn't it? Than, than just blatant outright, yeah, I know I'm doing wrong. Start talking about self-sufficiency where we put our trust in ourselves, that's a little harder because you go, oh, am I doing that or am I not doing that? As a Christian, it's easy to say the right thing with this, but then to do the wrong thing when it comes to situations and circumstances in our life. Here's a question to test this. If you're like, I'm not sure I'm doing this. All right, question. When anything comes up and starts to shake you, all right, that can be a lot of stuff, right? Like my marriage, something with my child, my thought process in life. Oh, I'm getting anxious. I'm getting worried. I'm getting, all right, COVID has affected things. So for me, that was a big one with church and stuff. Oh my gosh, what do I do now? And if you know me at all, I go into strategic mode. We're going to do this, this. I don't go into prayer mode. I don't go, God, what do you, what do I need to do here? He's not. So when you start to get shaken just a little bit, where do you go? Is it to self or is it God? I need you here. I'm shaking. I'm, 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 something's not right. Where do we go? Is it ourselves or is it God? And here's how you know, I think, even pushing past that a little bit. Scripture speaks so much of peace. Do you have peace? If the answer is no, then probably you're being too self-sufficient. I got my hand up for this one. Because when I'm self-sufficient, I'm facing situations, but I'm not doing a very good job. Not like God could do, because you know, he like, he's got the universe in the palm of his hand. So I mean, I can't, I can't keep my own life together, and he's got the universe in the palm of his hand. So maybe he understands and knows and can give me what I need in this moment to be able to get through this. Self-sufficiency is a subtle thing the enemy will use to lure you from the path. I believe we have a spiritual enemy, and he's like, hey, you got this. Man, God, God ain't got this. He ain't going to help you with this one. You're going to have to solve this one on your own. So self-sufficiency, if that's you, and it's certainly me, it's certainly many of us, um, it's in our culture. It's especially in our American culture where we think we got it all together. We don't need no help. You know, all of a sudden you veered off the path. And so what's the, what's the answer? What do leaders do? They return. God, I've been self-sufficient and I need to be, my sufficiency needs to be you. I need your peace. And so I'm going to have to return to the path. All right. That's the second one. Here's the most subtle one of all. Some of us are going to write this off. It's so subtle. Status quo living. Status quo means like regular. Um, it means average. Lukewarm is a, is a good word for status quo. Mediocre. So many Christians accept status quo Christian living. And when you do so, you and I have veered off the path that God has for us. Because I'm here to tell you, you don't have a status quo God. You don't have, you have a God who looks out at nothing 
and says, I'm going to create everything. That's a little above average, I'd say. Let me create the universe. Let me make people. Let me give them noses and ears and some of them no hair and some of them hair and stuff like that. I mean, that's how incredible I am. And then let me do this and let me do that and let me help people change people's lives. And let me, let me give people marriages that demonstrate what, what my relationship with people looks like. That's the picture of marriage. And you know, well, you're like, I can't do that one. Yeah, you're fine with mediocre. Average. Status quo. Man, I mean, we got, like I said, and this is a big one for Shauna and I. I mean, I struggle with, like, just status quo in our relationship. I do. She's better at it than me. I'm telling you. She won't accept it. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus even though it drives me crazy sometimes. And she's in a room. I said that, I know. But that's who God is. I wrote something down. I don't know if this makes sense. It made sense to me. Mediocre, lukewarm, status quo, Christian life equals mediocre, lukewarm, status quo, Savior. Wow. So what I'm saying is your Christian life reflects that of who your God is. And so when the world looks at you, they go... I mean, there ain't no difference in John. Like, he, there's nothing there that's exciting or, like, different or life-changing. I mean, why would I become a Christian? He doesn't treat people differently. He doesn't, you know, it, it, he just lives life the way everybody else lives life. Status quo. No. <laughs> you have an unbelievable God. You have a God who wants to make an impact. You have a God who wants to see things change. You have a God that heals and reconciles and redeems and restores and changes this world. You have a God who loves the next generation and wants to see them be... I, I find myself just saying to the next generation, you can be such a light in this world for God. And we don't tell them that enough. And our lives don't look like that enough, church. We veered off the path, some of us. This is me, man. I'm more the second two at this point. Now, I, it's not that I don't sin. I'm just not living in big ones right now, except the second two. <laughs> but I'm telling you, self-sufficiency and this idea of status quo living, don't accept it. Reject it. Fight against it. Don't accept this, because this is not what God has for us. So where are you today? Where you at? Here's my question. Do we have any prodigals in the house today? Any prodigals watching online right now? What do you mean prodigal? You veered off the path. You left God's best for you. And maybe it's sin right now. Maybe it's this idea of self-sufficiency. Maybe it's just simply status quo. And I know, y'all, I know. Listen, I know that you hear like status quo and, you, and, and we start going, John, do you know what I'm dealing with right now? Do you know what, do you know what's going on? You ever notice you're always like, I'm gonna get to that tomorrow. No, God wants to make an impact through whatever you're dealing with right now. That's where he wants to do the work. He uses your very life to do the work. So you don't fix your marriage and then all of a sudden live the... No, it's the marriage that he wants to do it with, if that's the issue for you. If it's anxiety and worry and things like this in your mind, it's, it's he wants to work in that and through that. Whatever it is, it's where he's at. Any prodigals today? Any, anybody that's like, yeah, man, I'm, I didn't realize it, but I'm in the, I'm in the pig slop right now. Thanks for bringing that up, John. I came to church looking for an uplifting message. Most uplifting thing I can say to you is return <laughs> to God's best for you. He's such a loving father. He wants you home. Man, compared to pig slop sty, blah, to the house that the son went home to and the party he received, <laughs> and being with his dad again. We need to return from sin, from self-sufficiency, from status quo living. Sure, there's other things, but those are the big three for me, and maybe you identify with those as well. So return.
Any prodigals? I know, you're thinking, oh man, you about to like, yeah, ask people, stand up, pray for them. Yep, I am. Um, here at your own home, I'm going to do that in a moment, but let me just kind of tell you what you're probably thinking. Well, man, it's embarrassing. Okay, so you're going to stay dirty? You're going to stay with the pigs? Because you're embarrassed, are you going to go home? Like, go home, man. Return to the life God has for you, to his best. Because here's the thing, that kid came home, he was stinky. He didn't, doesn't say he stopped by to take a shower at, you know, the pilot gas station, none of that, right? His family might have been like, well, we'll stone him later, he smells, right? The father embraced him in all his stench, in the dirtiness. He didn't tell him, go take a shower before I hug you. He embraced him as he was. God accepts us where we are right now, here today. There's not a thing you have to do except return. That's it. Some of us will do it. Some of us will, won't, but I don't know. Are there any prodigals? So let's, I'm going to pray and I'll, I'll ask prodigals to stand. I stand with you. Jesus, thank you for loving us. And I think there's some prodigals in the house today. And so I'm going to invite them. They're already standing. If that's you, thank you. Stand up. I just want to pray for you. And maybe at home, there's some people that, that feel like prodigals. Like right now, it's something about sin, it's self-sufficiency, it's, <laughs> it's status quo living. It's not believing that God has something better when he does. God, I just thank you for my friends who are standing here and even at home, or even if you're watching this late or not live, stand up right where you are and let me pray for you. God, I lift these friends up to you. First of all, they're your friends. They're your sons and daughters. You love them. You just want them to come home. You just want them to return because you have a better life for them than what they're experiencing. So God, we return home. I return home. I'm stepping back onto that path. <laughs> and here's what's crazy, y'all. Maybe you're a thousand steps from the path. You turn around, boom, one step, you're back. That's how good God is. He brings you right back onto it. You don't have to earn it, do anything. Just return. So God, for those of us who return from our sin, would you heal us and reconcile us to you right now? God, for those of us who have been self-sufficient, will you, will you become our sufficiency? Will you become our Prince of Peace rather than our own hearts? God, we need peace. We're struggling. And God, for those who are living the status quo Christian life, will you remind us and show us that you have more for us than that? Thank you, God, that we can return over and over and over again. Keep our feet on the path. Guide us. Give us people that will surround us as we do it. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the most extravagant of all. Amen. Amen. Can we give God praise? And